everybody. I'm Carrie. I'm in going to introduce my good friend, Alicia Chapman. She has been a veteran in the banking industry for the past 27 years. She has a God gift a God-given gift in the area of money and finance. Her heart is to see people flourish at whatever social economic level they happen to be at at the moment. She believes in the biblical principle of tithing and giving and knowing that with consistency and faith, God will take you, you to the next level in your finances. She has a common sense approach to budgeting and personal finance and follows no nonsense guidelines to put people on the course of wealth and prosperity. We want to welcome our Alicia Chapman to the podium. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to be talking about personal finances and budgeting, but before I begin, let me start by just saying that the most important thing in any aspect of your finances is to be a faithful tither. That's where it all starts. If you're not tithing, you're starting off on the wrong foot. So that's where we're going to start. That should be the top priority for your income. It's a way to show that we trust God with our lives and with our finances. It also teaches us to be good stewards with what God has given us. And the real beneficiaries of tithing is the people that's writing the check or making those payments over the internet. It's us. Um, Pastor and prophetess doesn't need our money. God doesn't need our money. That benefit is solely ours. So when you're looking at the, the tithing principle, that is a blessing for us. You know, we've all heard Malachi 3.10. It's quoted a lot when it's time for offering. That says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. But the last part of the scripture, God makes a promise to us that when we faithfully tithe, he will open the windows of heaven and pour our blessings that there will not be room enough for us to receive it. So a lot of people have the mindset, if you're looking at your salary and your account, I can't afford to tithe. Let me tell you that you cannot, you can't afford to not tithe. There is a blessing that comes with that principle that will always cover you. When in 2000, when I decided I want a house. I really didn't tell anybody except my mom at the time. But prophetess called me up on Sunday. She said, God said you can have that house. And I'm like, okay, I'm still in with my mom, but I'm going to work on it. So I knew there were some things that I had to do. I always was a tither, you know, but I, there were some other sacrifices I needed to make in order to save up money for that house. And those are the things that I did. And because I did that and because I did stay faithful to my tithing, if I thought that I fell short, and I probably didn't, but I was first-time homeowner and I was budgeting, I was like, I think I need three more dollars in my account. You know, I would get a three-dollar check in the mail from some rebate or some refund from Bell Soft or somebody to cover that to the penny what that shortage was. So trust God. Let him prove to you that what he says is real. He will provide. He will supply what you need. Um, when I moved into my house, pastor and prophets came over and they prayed with me, blessed the house. And one of the things that pastor said was, the blessing of the Lord makes a person rich and it adds no sorrow with it. So if I ever felt stressed, I always went back to that scripture. There's no sorrow with it. This air conditioner broke, that's okay. God will provide. Uh, he's going to take care of it. So you have to find something that sticks for you. That stuck for me. And so I've been in my house 23 years this year. I've never had a disconnect. I've never had a struggle. There's never been a time I was concerned about paying my house note because there was no, I confess, there's no sorrow It's going to be with the house, and there has never been any sorrow added with my house. It has truly been the blessing that God said it's supposed to be. So just trust God in that. Pay your tithes, and he's going he's gonna to take care of you. So to get started with what we're here for today on budgeting and finance, so for, I want to talk first, let's make sure that you know what a healthy financial life looks like. So you need to know your household income and expenses. You need to spend less than you make. Your money should have a plan. You need to work that plan and know that financial success is not based on how much you make, but successfully managing what you have. It's not based on your salary. If you are married, you need to be sharing your income with your spouse. It shouldn't be a secret. Um, 
when you get married, you know, the pastor always says, and the two shall become one. That's not just the name. That's not just to live in the same house together. That's sharing everything, including your finances. And unfortunately, it also includes the debt. If you get married and your husband or wife has debt, that debt becomes yours. It limits what you can spend as well as it does him. So you're taking on everything. When you say I do, you're accepting everything that goes with that man or that woman, including that debt. So you need to make sure that you're sharing those so that you know what you're working with and you can help to create a plan that you all can work together. It brings unity when you work together and it also helps create accountability, honesty, in a sense that we got this, we're gonna work on this together. You set common goals and then you need to set clear boundaries on spending limits and make sure that you both are aligned and working towards that goal. Remember that marriage is a partnership, it's not a joint venture, it's a covenant, and you need to be faithful to, to that. So when you're getting married, or if you are married and you're getting married, it helps you to communicate better. If you're planning to get married, talk about those things beforehand so you know exactly what you're getting to, into. I'm a saver. I can't marry a person that's not mindful with their, their money. I like, I wanna save up, I wanna have that, you know, saving in case something happens. If you marry somebody that blows money, it's gonna be a problem. M money issues are the number two cause for divorce. So it's that since you need to get your finances in order, you need to get your mindset set that we're gonna, we're gonna work this. Infidelity. Yeah. So, um, the it, it helps the communication and it, and it teaches you, it um, forces you really to discuss important um, issues like your goals, your dreams, and even your legacy that you want to leave to your children. If y'all are not working together, you're, there's not uh, one accord there, you're going to find it, it rolls over to other areas of your life. So we're going to get started. So um, some of the most common money traps that people um, don't think about it as a trap and we just do it because, oh, that's just, that's just the way business is, or late fees, high interest rates, penalties, disconnect and reconnect fees, and high interest rates. I don't like giving these companies any more than I have to. If you um, habitually pay your bills late, all you're doing is making income for energy or the phone company or whoever you pay late to, that's straight income for them. When you, I work at a bank. When you pay late to the bank, that's interest income for me. That's how we get our bonuses, that's how the bank works. So you're giving away money that you don't have to give away. So in that case, you are not really being mindful. You're not being good stewards over your money if you are habitually paying late charges every month just because you're not staying on top of your business. So it's gonna, it's, uh, getting a budget forces you to get your, your finances in order. And it also got some habits and, and things that you need to work on. So debt delusion. Some of the things, some, it's just it's mindset, finance is mindset. Some things come from our parents, some things we just formed as we went along, you know, we grew up and this is how I'm gonna spend and some of these mindsets need to change. Well, another big trap is credit cards. Your credit limit should not be, uh, it should not, or it should be thought of as a loan as opposed to free money, it's not free money. You know, it's so easy to go and swipe that card, I'm, I'm gonna get this. And that's, that's not wise because you, um, you end up paying all the interest and finance charges, but you need to pay, if at all possible, your balance in full by the due date. And if you don't pay it at the end of the month, you have to pay that much more in interest. Um, my brother gets, I have him, he has one card. You can only have one card, I manage his finances. And this, this card is strictly for plane tickets to come home. And we're gonna pay it off at the end of the month, and if you miss it, sister's not gonna be happy. So, I mean, right now when he called, he, he called me the other day, he's like, sister, can I buy some new golf clubs? I'm like, let me look at your money. <laughs> yes, you can buy golf clubs. You did. Yes, you can buy a golf club. You need to, sometimes you need to have an accountability partner. You know, he, he realizes now when, I mean, when I first started pushing him on finances and getting the order, he was like, I can't afford that. I'm like, I'm going to show you that you can. You're, you, you can afford what you want. You may have to save up for it. You may have to cut on some other things, but anything you want, you can have it. You just have to handle your finances the right way to get it. So you need to be mindful of your spending and make sure you're not buying more than you can afford. And making the minimum on your credit card balance is nothing. That's strictly going to the company that is not paying your, your balance in full. You'll end up with having this credit card for years and years to come. I have an example up there. 
I lowballed it because I know a lot of people have more than ten thousand dollars in uh, credit cards, uh, debt, at least the ones that I deal with at the bank. So if you have a, a credit card and it has a balance of ten thousand dollars, I put the interest rate in is fourteen point nine six percent. Most credit cards are higher than that, mm -hmm. and if your credit is bad, you cannot have up to twenty twenty five percent. So with this one, we did three percent of the payment. So if you owe the company ten thousand dollars, and this is considering that you don't use this card again. No more. That's it. I'm not, I'm, all I'm going to do on this card is pay. No more charging. At that interest rate, it's going to take you 20 years to pay off $10,000. That's 236 months right at 20 years. So for you uh, charge up $10,000, you're going to end up paying them back $6,973.43 in interest. That's straight income for them. So you spent ten thousand you're going to pay back seven almost seventeen thousand dollars that math not math to me I, I just don't want to give out more than i than i need to and that's why you need to try as hard as you can to not use the card and if you use the card pay the card off at the end of the month it's not supposed to be a catch-all well i feel short so i'm gonna put it on my card because if you don't have the discipline you're not gonna pay that card off anyway so you just need to know that i'm, I'm not gonna do it know yourself be honest with you yeah i ain't gonna do that um, another trap is payday loans. Payday loans are designed to trap you in a cycle of debt. They're not governed like the banks are. They can pretty much do whatever they want to. And while they may seem like an option for an emergency, a payday loan negatively affects your credit and can add additional stress in an already stressful situation. Most people go get them. There is a situation that's there, but you know, you commit and in two weeks I get paid, I'm gonna come back and give you this money. The likelihood of you having that money in two weeks is really slim and we know that so what happens is you go back to them and they have to extend that loan and then they add more fees or you end up going to the other finance company down the street to get the money to pay this one off and so you always end up in this cycle of trying to catch up and pay somebody this money and those finance charges can be up to 30 percent of the amount that you borrow the interest rates are extremely high because they aren't governed so it's just not wise to go to a finance, you know, the finance company and the payday loan companies. Um, in essence, you know, all debt really is bad debt. People tell you, you know, if you, if you keep something on your credit card, um, it helps your credit score. We don't have to live in debt. That's my, that's my opinion. We don't always have to owe somebody. I want to live my life debt free. Um, even the Bible warns us against the use of debt. In Proverbs 22, seven, it says, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. So if you become burdened with a lot of debt, you are really a slave to the creditor. Every time you get paid, you owe them that money. You can't go out to the game, you can't go to the mall, because you already owe them before you even get your money. I don't want to be indebted to somebody to that point, because it just adds additional stress for me. Um, you just obligated to meet those debts, and then when you don't meet them or you pay them late, then you go into the late charges and the penalties. And again, it's not using, you know, wisdom. So what I find, what I've, I a lot of people I've talked to, what they do is, well, now I'm overwhelmed with debt. I, I don't know what to do, now I'm stuck. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna file bankruptcy, and I'm gonna get rid of all of it. Um, <laughs> bankruptcy is not a go-to, because you didn't manage your finance. It's really not. Now. Don't get me wrong, it can help. If you are really, like there's no, no other option, you've done everything that you can, you've talked to credit counselors, everything, then explore it. But don't use it as that your first go-to because you didn't do what you need to do with your finances. It's designed to provide relief uh, for people who can no longer keep up with their debt, but you should consider all the pros and the cons of bankruptcy. It does not discharge child support debt, back taxes, or other debt from legal obligations. And um, student loans, they're going, Uncle Sam is going to fight you. He's pro most times they will not discharge a student loan debt unless God is on your side. Yes, ma'am. Um, are you going to give us a printout of this PowerPoint? Um, I can. Are you, you I can. I, I, don't, I don't have it printed, but I can get you a copy. If I, I can get your email address for anybody who wants it and send it out to you. Okay, thank you. Um, before you file bankruptcy, you know, meet with the credit counselor, meet with somebody that can talk to you, look at what you have, because it may be hard for you to see, if you're not a finance person, how to pay off that debt, but if you sit with somebody else, they can look at like, girl, all you gotta do is pay extra $50 a month, and this will be paid off in six months, you ain't got to do this. 
So don't assume that that's your only option because in most cases, there are other options that you can take when it comes to your finances. It's something that'll be a lot less stressful and cost you a lot less. The most um, common types of bankruptcy are chapter seven. Um, that's where they take your assets, basically they sell them to pay off your debts. It can stay on your credit report for up to 10 years from the filing date. And then for chapter 13, which is the second most common form, it's a three to five year repayment plan and it can stay on your credit report for up to seven years. The type of bankruptcy you qualify for may depend on your income and the value of what you own. So just because you file for it doesn't mean you're gonna get approved for it. it had, there still are some qualifications for bankruptcy. Some of the positives of bankruptcy is the relief from dealing with multiple creditors. I know that's stressful, you get those phone calls and they, they put um, laws in place now where they can't call you 10, 11 o'clock at night, but they will call you up until the last minute they can and blow up your phone trying to get you on the phone to, to make a payment. Um, it can prevent further legal action. It can prevent your home from being foreclosed on or your car from being repossessed. Your debts may settle for less than what's owed, which is something that you can do on your own. If you call a credit card company and get to their collections department and say, look, I know I owe you 3000 I really don't have it. Can I pay you 1500 right now? Some will say yes because they just want something and it shows that you're willing to work with them. You're not avoiding the phone calls, you're not avoiding the letters, you really want to work. And they have a bucket, they can, they can write off certain debt. So if you are in that situation, call them. They may say no, but a lot of them will say yes. And some of your debts will be completely written off. Some of the negatives of bankruptcy is that you could lose those assets, you could lose your home and your car. Your car insurance premiums go up because they do run your credit when you go to get car insurance. Bankruptcy can be quite expensive. Chapter seven on an average usually runs between $1,000 and $1,750 out of pocket. If you, um, chapter 13 runs about $3,300 out of pocket. Chapter seven, I think you have to wait four years if you wanna apply for a house after that to get you another one. And for chapter 13, um, you have to wait two years from the day that it's discharged from the courts because all this goes through the court system. Usually when you file bankruptcy, like I get notices at our bank saying, this customer filed bankruptcy, we can't contact the customer anymore. Anything we do at that point, we're dealing with the trustee or with the bankruptcy court. So it does take off some pressure, but that debt, it, you know, it's still debt, it, it's still looming over your head. Um, bankruptcy can stay on your credit for up to 10 years. So um, your credit score is gonna be impacted, it's gonna drop and um, the bankruptcy is made public. It's, there's a, in the newspaper, there's a section and it shows who filed bankruptcy, who sued them, who's charged against them. And I don't know about you, I'm very private, don't have a lot of people in my business, but it is publicized. And there are some people that watch the paper just for nosiness reasons and will tell your business. And we all know somebody like that. And, or some people look to see who's um, having the house foreclosed on because they go pay it and they, get, they can get your house. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So adjudicated you wanna make sure, ma'am. Is that like adjudicated property? It's, it can be adjudicated or, yeah, so adjudicated is when you don't pay your property taxes. Um, so if you don't pay your taxes for three years and somebody else does pay your taxes, they own your property. Um, if they pay those taxes and you wanna get the property back, they can charge you 100% interest if they want to. They can charge you whatever fees they want to because there's no regulation on that. And trust me, it's not easy. Um, I have had to go to court to fight for a customer who didn't pay their taxes and, and because we had a lien on his house, I had to get that back because that was my collateral. You have to all do all kinds of negotiating with the person that paid it. You have to get a new deed filed. It's just a lot of work. So don't put yourself in a situation where you have to deal with that because that's just added stress. But people are looking, most of the companies that I've dealt with out of Missouri, they're watching Louisiana papers to see who's not paying their taxes so they can pay them and get them a house. So your house may be valued at say $100,000. Your taxes may only have been 5,000. So they getting your, your $100,000 house of 5,000, they just gonna sell it. Or they're gonna negotiate with you to give back more of your money. So just be mindful to pay your property taxes. So what happens is at, after, year, after year three, that tax bill is changed to that person's name. And then the, the parish, depending on the parish, EBR, East Baton Rouge is slow. 
So, but they will, they actually file documents saying that it's been sold to, it's now in this person's name. So now you have to, have to go and deal with that person to get that back in the real owner's name. But doing that, you have to go and you have to pay them what they, because they pay money. Right. You have to go and repay them. And even if they pay 5000 and they say, I'm going to give it back to you, but you're going to give me 10 If you want your property back, you're right. going to give them 10 Wow. And they don't have to file a monition, the person that paid the property tax. They don't have to file what? A monition is what it's called. My aunt, well, this is the thing. I have family property, and I redeemed from a tax uh, sale. Okay. And my aunt told me after five years I have to file a monition in order to get the property legally in my name. Whose name is it in right now? It's still in my grandfather's name. So it was like air property? Yes. So, no, you can, I mean, they can, you can do a, a honestly, they can do an donation and just give it to you and get it switched to your name. I mean, you would have to go to an attorney to get that done. Oh. You do need a legal document because you want to have it recorded in public record that you are now the owner of that property. I'm sorry, a person that you're talking about that from Missouri buys somebody's property, they don't have to go through legal uh, proceedings? They just work with the parish. They work with the parish that they're paying the taxes with. The, they handle everything with that clerk of court office or the sheriff's office that they're dealing with. Oh, okay. Because, you know, that's where you, all your documents are recorded, there at, with, the, with, the, with the clerk of court. They record the cash sales and the mortgages. All that stuff is housed right there in the different clerk of court offices in each parish. So when I go to cancel a mortgage for a customer or whatever, I go to the parish where that hot property was and I cancel it with them. Yeah. So um, in addition to having a way to purchase a home, one of my biggest issues with bankruptcy is it does not address what led up to the problem in the first place. If you mismanage, and for whatever reason, maybe you didn't know what you were doing, maybe you were, you just didn't understand. Maybe you, you lost a job. Things happen. Life happens. But whatever reason, you need to deal with the core of what got you to that position and not just file bankruptcy because if you don't, you will find yourself in the exact same situation again. I know people that filed bankruptcy multiple times, but that means you didn't learn the lesson that you need to learn to keep you out of that situation. And so you don't want to just have that be a fallback because that means you, there's something that you need to do to prevent that from going on in the future. So be honest with yourself, you know, about your spending habits, about your financial practices, and realize I have to make some changes. And y'all, it's not always the devil. He didn't put you in that spot. The reason you lost your house is not because he did it. You lost it because you didn't pay your bill. Mm -hmm. And the bank came behind you. So, I mean, he got a lot of blame for stuff. It, that's on me. You know, be accountable. Take responsibility for what you have because you can't fix it if you don't admit it. So now we're gonna get to, you know, what is a budget? A budget is merely a plan for manager, managing your income and expenses for a period of time. It's a plan for managing your money in a way that best meets your personal needs and wants to help you track your spending and live within your means. A lot of times we don't live within our means. You wanna live between your friends' means because they can travel, you might not be able to go. I'm bring pictures back. Let me see what you went because I'm not gonna be able to make it this time. Um, they're not difficult to establish, but they do take time and they do take commitment. You have to be willing to put in, to work, in the work to work the plan. If you don't, it's going to fail. The benefits of a budget, it can help you develop better financial habits, avoid impulsive and unnecessary spending so that you live within your means. It can reduce stress and increase your confidence, and it can assist you in achieving your financial goals. The risk of not having a budget, on the other hand, a stress. You have no idea where your money ha is, has been. When you look back, I just got paid Friday. It's Monday. Where my money at? I don't know because now you went out Friday night. Woohoo, payday. You know, you got your hair done. You got all these things done. And now you don't have money to take care of what you need. I found that the people who ask me for money, you know, that I need to borrow. I, I need to, let me get some with you. It's because they've taken care of their wants and they want me to take care of their, of their needs. So um, not having a budget has you un unprepared for emergency situations, it's constrained relationships, and you have wasted money. 
The first thing you need to do before you create a budget is I need you to understand a want versus a need. A want, a need are your necessities. That's your food, your shelter, reliable transportation. Those are your needs. A want is entertainment, it's travel, it's your cell phone, it's getting your nails done. Those are things you just want. You don't have to have those things. And you have to be able to know the difference and be able to say, this needs to wait. You, sh you should always deal with your wants, your needs first. When your money is tight, your wants have to wait, always. So when you look at trying to get out of debt, and you're looking at what's your money needs versus your wants, this is how my brain works. So you get your nails done. You pay $50 every two weeks, let's say. Some people pay more if you get the designs and all the other stuff. $50 every two weeks for 26 weeks uh, um, in a year, $1,300 you spend a year on your nails. If you go to eat out for, we, we did a low average, $30 a week, it's 52 weeks, that's $1,560 for the year that you spend at McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, Fleming's, wherever you decide to go. If you're a coffee drinker, I'm not, but I heard it was a five, five, say $5 a day. That's $25 a week. That's $1,300 a year. $1,300 payments you can make towards a student loan. $1,300 you can catch up your, behind your delinquent loan payments. $1,500 you can use to put towards a car. So there's so much other things that are necessity that you can put towards that money. You have to decide or you have to be able to discern, is this a need or is this a want? And you need to you put your money where it needs to be at the right time. And that's going to take discipline. And any addictions that you have, cigarettes, alcohol, gambling, porn, all these things that, that can take your money, eliminate them. Cut them out. They steal your health and they steal your wealth. Now, to track our spending, you need to know how much money you have coming in, how much money you have going out, and where your money's going. So for 30 days, you need to write down uh, everything that you spend and be honest. If it's a pack of gum, write it down. If it's a pack of cigarettes, write it down. Whatever it is, nobody's gonna see your budget but you. So be honest, everything you spend, everything you bring in needs to go on a piece of paper in order for you to have an actual budget that you can work with. So your income, just to make sure everybody understands, it can be your take-home pay, tips, bonuses, cash, disability payments, social security payments, alimony, or child support. Anything you have coming in, that's income. You need to document those on your spreadsheet. You have two types of expenses. You have fixed expenses and you have variable expenses. So your fixed expenses are going to be your ties, your rent or your mortgage, your car note, your cell phone bill, any fees for streaming services, if you have Netflix, Hulu, or whatever the others are, um, your insurance premiums, disability payments, social security payments, alimony, and child support. These usually stay the same from month to month. Variable expenses are things like grocery, utilities, gifts, entertainment, and gas. You know, they change depending on how much riding you do, how, much meal, how many meals you cook, if you're going to the movies or not, so those things are changed from month to month. A good rule of thumb applies, so this applies to your take home pay, is to do 70-20-10. Um, so 70% of your take home pay goes to your needs, 20% goes for discretionary, that's your entertainment, travel, all the extra stuff, and 10% always to your savings. You always, you need to have a savings. So let's say you make $3,000 a month. Your, um, the 70% would be about $2,100. Your savings, you would need to save at least $300 from, uh, over, the, over the month. So 150 I don't know if you get paid weekly or monthly, but at the end of the month, you have $300 in your savings. And then that would have $600 for your discretionary spending. And you can adjust however, wherever you, you, know, you need to. But it's important that you save. I think I put a, a, a sample of the spreadsheet on the screen. There's also one in your folder just so you can see the different categories. They're separated, what's fixed, what's variable, what's income, 
and expenses. So that sheet is going to be in your folder for you to look at. If you have questions about it, um, just, just ask me when we go to lunch or whatever. I'll, I'll be glad to answer any questions. So when you're tracking your spending, what you're going to do is you're going to subtract your expenses from your income. If that number is negative, that means you don't have enough money to cover those expenses, you need to adjust your variable expenses so you can live within your means, and, and you need to avoid using credit cards to do that. If that number is positive, you are already living within your means, and so what you could do now, that means you have extra money, start, start saving if you don't. Start saving for an emergency fund. Put that money to the side for those kind of situations. So that's why you want to make sure you're putting everything that you spend so when you're looking at what you're working with every month, you have true numbers. There's multiple kinds of budgets, and there's even some software online. There are some free things you can do um, on the Internet. Dave Ramsey is a great person, uh, a great site to go to to get some information on um, the different types of budgeting and uh, ways to budget. But I, I'm going to talk about three of them, the envelope system, the checkbook system, and the notebook system. Um, there's also some software you can buy on your, to put on your computers. But just remember, it's important that you document everything. Your plan can only work if you work it. Garbage in, garbage out. The success of your budget depends on you. So for the envelope system, at the beginning of the month, what you're going to do is place your cash in separate envelopes. Each envelope is going to be ca categorized based on the things on that list. So you're going to have some cash for grocery. You're going to have something for gas. You're going to have for all the different categories. You're going to put... Okay, I'm going to put $100 for, for grocery this month. I'm going to put $100. So you're going to put that money in an envelope. As you spend money out of each envelope, you're going to write down on the front of the envelope $10 grocery. You'll either write it down or put your receipt in there so you can always go back and you can balance to whatever was supposed to be in that envelope. So as you spend the money, you write the amount on the envelope. When that money's gone, it's gone. It's exhausted. You, if you put 100 for grocery and it's gone before the month end, you don't get any more grocery. The, the principle is you don't get more grocery, but what you're going to have to do is take money from something else that you put money in and put it over in the grocery category. So you can't go out to eat because now I'm going to reallocate those funds to my grocery. I just wanted to tell you there's an app on the phone called Good Budget, and it's an envelope program like she's talking about, but you just enter it in on your phone instead, and it works the exact same way. And it's going to teach you discipline. If you're honest with yourself, if you're honest and you need to be, you're going to look at that, at that envelope and say, well, shoot, I, really, I can't eat out anymore this week. Let me look at my other envelopes and see. So I gave myself, you know, this amount of money to go to the game on Friday. I might not be able to go to the game, but I'm going I'm, I'm to have to put that money in this envelope so I can take care of what I need to. That's when you really figure out what you really need and what you really want. Um, for the checkbook system, you're going to use your checkbook register to track your deposits and your spending. Deposit 100% of your checks into your checking account, and you're going to pay most of your expenses with your check, with your debit card, or have your own automatic payment, so you're not even thinking about it. You even need to record your ATM withdrawals and your debit card transactions in your register during that time with the purpose for the expense so you can see where your money is going. Then review your monthly statements to ensure that you haven't missed anything. And by that, I mean your, your statement that comes in from the bank, if you get those uh, statements, and if not, you can get them online and look and make sure that you haven't missed something. You know, sometimes we go to ATM to pull out some money and you stick the receipt in the car like I do, and then you forget to go and log it. So that'll make sure that you're not missing anything when you're coming up with your, uh, with your budget. So always reconcile your statement. Um, uh, reconcile your envelopes or your notebook or whatever, your spreadsheet against your bank statement so you haven't missed anything. And, you know, back in the day, people would write a check and say, I'm going to beat this to the bank. I'm going to make the I'm going to go ahead and spend the write the check now, but I'm going to get paid in two days. I'm going to go and take it. Well, that's non existent. There's a um, system now called Automatic Clearinghouse that the bank shoes. If you write me a check today, I can cash this check, I can run this check today. So there is no more beating the check to the bank in most cases. So please don't write a check and try to how to make it. Because now not only do you, do you still owe this vendor, whoever you want the check to, but now you owe me NSF fees, you got chargeback fees, and again, it's income for the bank, it's a loss for you. It's another money trap. Just be mindful of it.
Um, the note in the notebook system is like the others, except you use a notebook to track your expenses. You just write on the top of each page the category and what you budget for each of the categories as you spend. Write those amounts down. Make sure you, you subtract from that amount at the top to make sure you stand on top of it. And once you zero out, the money is gone. If you need money in a needs category, go back to one of your want categories. Take money from that from that area. Put it as a need and just know that whatever that one is, it might not have. You might not be able to get your nails redone this week or get your hair done. It might need to wait till your next pay period. So it's just really, dis it's really discipline. So I'm a big proponent of savings. You need to, you need to save. So you need, you need to review your paycheck to determine how much you can put into your savings account each pay period. It doesn't have to be a lot. Start small if you have to. If you could do $10, $20 a pay period, then do that. One of the things that worked for me is I have my account set up where when I get paid, my, um, my bank automatically pulls a certain amount from my check and put it into my savings account. If I have to do the work, I'm probably not going to do it. So they do it for me. It's, it's a process that happens automatically. So for me, it's out of sight, out of mind. I just know that when I look at my savings, I got, enough, I got some more money in there. So that's a good option to, to look at if you, while you're getting disciplined, let them do some work for you. But just start putting something to the side because you'd be surprised how at the end of the year or the end of the month where, where you are without even thinking about, about it. Um, so the, the ultimate goal is to have an emergency fund of three to six months of your living expenses. Um, this is once you get your bills paid, once you get your money under control. That's the goal that you want to have. So if something happens, you're not feeling tempted to swipe the card, you're not tempted to run to the payday uh, loan place, I got this in my savings, I'm gonna pull it. That's truly what your savings account is for. True emergencies, not because I feel short this month on the light bill. Um, for things like holidays, birthdays, back to school, college fund if you have kids, vacations, these are things that you know are gonna come around. Christmas comes every year on December 25th. You should not start shopping on the 20th and stressing out and going to the payday loan company because you don't have the money. On December 26th of the year, start putting some money to the side. Start your Christmas club account. A lot, a lot of banks have them. It's not wise to wait until the event and then you call in your family to borrow money. You go into these companies, you swipe your credit card. You have put yourself, you did this in a situation that didn't need to be. You know school starts in August. Don't wait till, you know, July 28th to start looking for school uniforms. And, oh, I don't have the money for all that. I don't have the money for uniforms. So you need to plan ahead. These things aren't surprises, and it's irresponsible to get to an event like that that you know is coming and not have what you need. You can't fault anybody for that other than yourself in reality, you know. Um, so save up so you're prepared and plan ahead. Proverbs 21.20 says, the wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. Don't be the foolish man. <laughs> for large purchases, when you are um, adjusting a budget, consider your future large purchases and consider saving up for things so you can pay cash for them. That way you don't have, you don't have any debt when it's done. Um, when you purchase a home or a car, um, you may have to make adjustments to entertainment, um, clothes. You may need to cut back on some other things. My brother decided last year, sister, I'm ready for a house. I said, okay, that means you can't put no more new, no mufflers and, and no more paint jobs on the Mustang. All this got to go. You got to keep it like it is. You know, you can't go out to eat. You, can, you can't keep doing some of the things you're doing. And so he was like, well, cool, let's cut it. His friends went to Ghana, Africa. He wanted to go. I'm like, you can't go. You can't afford it. You got this, you got this down payment you got to pay, and you have to be able to maintain once you get these things. And so he was like, cool, I, I can't go to Africa. So he didn't because you have to, what's, you gotta, what's it worth it to you? You want the gratification now or you want the gratification later? Um, when you purchase um, anything, Lord, just, just try to plan ahead as much as you can so that you're not adding additional stress to yourself. And know that just because you can make the payment, that don't mean you can afford it. Right. You have to consider everything that goes with that purchase. If you buy a house, you know, they, they pre-qualify you. I can afford the note, and that's great. 
but can you afford the light bill, the water bill, the PMI, the, the insurances, the, the yard work, you know, if the air conditioner go out, which mine did a year into buying my house, can you afford that? If you can't, you're not ready for a house. If you can afford the car, no, that's great. But can you afford it if you need to buy new tires, if you need to get your oil done, if you need a rotation, whatever it comes with that car, that's all included. People get so caught up thinking about the note without everything that goes with the note. So consider, yeah, I can make this payment, but can I really afford this before I buy it? Um, when you buy a car, the value of the car should not be over 50% of your annual income. For example, if you make $40,000, you don't need to own a car that's $25,000. It depreciates in value and it's, really, it's not really doing anything for you. And the car, in most cases, we're looking for the biggest, the best, the baddest on the street. It, don't, it doesn't need to be. Um, then you have a large part of your net worth tied up in something that depreciates in value. Your house, that appreciates as you do repairs on it, it's going up in value. Um, so, you know, I deal with a lot of millionaires. When the millionaires walk in the bank, y'all, you, you never know. They come in and cut off shorts and, and Hawaiian shirts and looking like, you know, bums, but they have a case in their hand and that case is full of money. They don't showcase their money. You know, the top, the top brands that, that um, I saw a report, the top brands of cars driven by millionaires are Toyota, Honda, and Ford. <laughs> and if you look on the parking lot, that's what you see. Pickup trucks, it might be a him, it might be the best of the best. You know, you wouldn't know it if you're not a car person, but they drive a pickup truck. But when they drive home, they drive home. Where are you going this weekend? I'm going to the ranch. Oh, yeah, I'm going to the Texas ranch this weekend, Alicia, if you need me, call me. I'm going to the Missouri ranch this weekend. Oh, you got a ranch over there too? See, it's, it's a mindset. You know, we want to have things to, to have a certain look. You know, when you don't waste money trying to look wealthy, you have money to actually become wealthy. So know the difference. I mean, I follow, I was behind a guy heading to my mom's house in a bad Jaguar. Y'all, it was bad. Clean, rims, you name it. His house, when he pulled up, I passed him as he turned in. I'm like, you pulling for your Jaguar to that? But it's a, it's a mindset. And it's a mindset that we need to get, to get out of. And culturally, it's, I see it worse for us than for other people, un unfortunately. You know, it's, it's a mentality that we need to kick so that the next generations know better and do better. Um, so remember, um, it's important to remember that budgets can and should change from time to time as situations change. Adjust your budget. You might get a raise. You might get a, a decrease with, with the times. You never know. So just adjust as you need to so you're always looking at actual numbers. After you're following your budget for a month, reevaluate it and make changes as necessary. And then, of course, again, make sure that you're saving for emergencies like job loss, major car repairs, and unexpected, uh, unexpected medical bills. This time when you're budgeting, it's a, season of, it's a season of sacrifice, but it's temporary. So even if it may be hard for you, just know that it's not ongoing. It's going to end, but right now you're working on something, and you need to stay committed to it. You know, God wants us to be able to do our nails and get our hair done and have the nice cars, but until you can get in order, step back and, let, and, and work on what you need to work on so you can have those things comf comfortably. Um, this is a time right now to change the course that you're currently on. You know, it's never too late, you're never too old, it doesn't matter if you're single, if you're married, you can work it. But one of the ways that you can easily tackle debt, and this is what I did with my brother, it's called the debt snowball method. You have a copy of that worksheet in your folder. So what you do is you list all of your debts from the smallest to the largest. So you know what your notes are. And so you put them on that piece of paper and you start off, so you pay whatever your minimum payment is on those loans at, for the month. And then for the smallest, for the smallest debt, you put um, extra debt. Anything extra, I mean, any extra money that you have, you're gonna pay towards the principal of the smallest debt. That, the plan towards the principal will help you pay that debt off quicker. If you're paying the minimum, it's really not gonna help you, so you need to put more. So do, what, do a little bit on the other ones, but try to focus more on that small one because you're gonna get it paid off faster. 
once you get that one paid off faster, now you freed up the extra you were paying on it and the note that you were paying on that smaller debt. Now take all that money and roll it to the next smallest one. So it's, that's what's called snowball. So as you pay off a debt, you take the money you were paying. Don't say, be like, oh, yeah, now I got an extra 300. No, now that 300 is going on this. You know, we just did this with my, with my brother who was working to pay off his student loans. I'm like, don't, yeah, you finished paying this debt, but now I want you to take this extra money. Pay your student loan. When he called us two weeks ago, and he had that zero, zero dollar uh, invoice for his um, student loan, we all had to dance with him. Because now, cause now he sees, when you can see it, now you're ready to work. And he said, okay, so, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take what I was paying on my student loan, and I'm gonna pay that extra on my car note. Because at the end of the year, I wanna be debt free. So when you see it, you want it more. And so, you know, I got him on board, and see, I'm excited because that's what I want for him too. You got a house and you have things you want to do, and let's get rid of this. To me, that's extra debt. You don't have to have a car note. You don't have to have the student loan. Get rid of it. Um, so that's, that's how the snowball works. You just keep knocking at it bit by bit, and that's why I'm saying even with like bankruptcy, sometimes it's something as simple as this that can help you to see it. You, you die, write it down and get rid of that debt without going and filing um, bankruptcy and damaging your credit score or your credit future. Because when you go to apply for a loan, you know, we pull a credit, we look at your credit report, I can see who you are without seeing your face and know what, what your priorities are. I can see what you value, I can see who you, I can see if you're a good student over your money or not, I can see exactly what you do because your credit tells on you. It, t it shows everything, it shows everywhere you've lived for, so, for the, you know, a number of years, everything you spent your money on. If you pay late one time, it shows me that. If you pay late 20 times, it shows me that. And that, that report dictates if you can get the loan or not, and if you do get it, are you gonna pay 8% or are you gonna pay 25% interest? You know, so your credit report is you. You control that, and if you don't know what's on your report, go to freecreditreport.com and request a copy. Look on there and see what's out there, because when I pull, I pull it once, you should pull it at least once a year. Because what I found that in, my, in mine, there's some things on mine that's not me. I'm like, I never, I never lived in Ohio. So what you do is you write a letter to the credit bureau and you dispute that. And those things come off your credit because as long as it's on your credit, it's impacting your score. With my brother, he and my dad have the same name. So for some reason, their stuff was getting crossed up on the credit report. So we had to go and fight and deal with that. I'm like, this on my dad's report, whose credit is much better, I'm gonna you take my brother's stuff off the top and get him right. <laughs> you know, so you need to go and see what's out there because it may not be factual information. They, they make mistakes. That's, it's a system, but it's people managing that system. So go look at your reports and see what's out there. Alicia, also, um, to piggyback on what you're saying about, you know, as you're snow snowballing, uh, paying off that debt, also, you gotten to a point now where that, where you, like you say, you're not seeing that money anyway. That's the perfect time to automatically, when you make that last payment, automatically roll that money into savings or some type of investment before you get too comfortable with having it in your little hot hands. Yeah, once you get it paid <laughs> off, just keep paying the debt off. And then once, like I said, once the debt is clear and now you don't owe it, then right now it's time for you to save. Now you can do other things with that money. But first priority is to get debt free. Okay, so in review, um, a budget is a, um, a tool to assist you in tracking and monitoring your income and expenses and avoid overspending. It's only as good and helpful as the time and the commitment that you choose to put into it. Financial independence is achieved by reducing spending, earning more, saving more, and avoiding overspending. You know, when I was growing up, my mom always told us, be careful who you hang around because association brings assimilation. I was like, eh, no, it don't. Oh, no, my, that's my friend. I want to go with her. You know, but I've gotten old. I mean, she didn't let me go. But, you know, as I've gotten older, I, I live on that. And so what I found is that, you know, when you have friends who spend and you want to be with those friends, you're going to do with your friends and you're going to assimilate. Well, are y'all going to Miami this weekend? Me too. My friends save. My friends say, we're going to Jamaica. Let's go next year. That gives us a year to save up and pay on this vacation. And when we get to Jamaica, we don't owe it. We don't come back to a bill because we put it on our credit card. It's paid for. Whatever money we spend is spent. And now we can go and say, okay, where are we going in 2024? What's the next trip? You know, so you have just be just be wise with it and watch 
Watch you, because you have a tendency to pick up who you're around. Mm -hmm. My friends don't do a lot of out. We don't do a lot of, you know, dinners. We may get together once a quarter, once every other quarter, whatever. But we, we keep in touch. And they know that we do what we got to do because we all have houses, we all have responsibilities. And I love you, but life goes on and I have I'm have i working on something right now. If they don't understand that, then they're not truly your friends. Get you a better circle. Because everybody's priorities are not the same, realistically. And you just have to recognize that. I mean, you can still be friends, but where I'm going, if you don't want to go with me, I'm going to have to leave you back here. I love you. I'm going to pray for you and hope that you get on board, too, because, hey, we can go to Paris next year. As y'all can tell, I love to travel. <laughs> um, and final, finally, I, and there's a sign that's in your folders just to keep up. Hang on to your refrigerator. Put it on your mirror. Just to keep in mind, and you get your budget done, so that you just know uh, it's temporary, but a budget, it, a budget isn't about restricting what you spend. A budget gives you permission to spend without guilt or regret. It doesn't have any problems. And one thing that I've always done, and you know, I'm going to advise you, is ask yourself, who, who or what is my, is, is my source? Because you, you can have the money and you can budget or whatever, but for me, I always knew that I had a job, but I never considered my job my source. I've always said that God is my source. Whoever your source is is who you're going to depend on for your survival. And a job can come and go. With the economy, it's up and down. If you depend on your bank account, it can be up and down. You know, stock market, it goes up and down, but God remains the same all the time. So know your source and know that he never changes. He doesn't depend on... Anything is not based on your salary, it's not based on your income, it's, I mean your, your ability is not based on your capacity, that he's always there. And even though a job can be taken from you or, or the, the income goes away, God never fails. He can never be taken from you. Um, knowing that God is your true source really does eliminate stress in your life. And Philippians 4.19, which we all know probably is, and it says, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And, you know, they always say you can't be God-given. You can. You can. Every, everything that you need, he, he can provide. You just have to do the work to show him that I got this. Now, I'm, I'm doing this, so now you, you pick up the rest. And, and he always will. In your, um, in your photos, I also, I put a, there's a copy of some daily, conf daily confessions for financial victory that you can put on your refrigerator. My mom's refrigerator is covered with her confessions, so this will just add to the list. But it's scriptures that you can say every day just to, uh, for financial victory. And there's also in there a prayer for financial wisdom. So pull that prayer out right now. We're going to do this prayer together. This is a prayer that you can do every day. You could do it every other day. It's your discretion, but it's just something that you need to speak over yourself, over your finances. You know, everybody doesn't, everybody doesn't have the same financial wisdom. If you don't have it, pray for it. It's there. Every, anything you need, you know, God can provide. Just know that. Y'all ready? You have your, uh, your prayer out? Okay, let's, let's read that together. Father, I know that it is your will that I prosper financially, even as my soul prospers. In the name of Jesus, I bind my mind to the mind of Christ, my financial decisions to the will of God, and my emotions to the control of the Holy Spirit. I resist the temptation to be slothful in business, and I purpose to be prompt about fulfilling my responsibilities with fervency of spirit, serving you. I pray that my integrity and uprightness will protect me because my hope is in you. Lord, I come to you with thanksgiving for all you have given me and how you bless and sustain me for all this time. I lift up to you my finances and thank you for your word that promises you will supply all my needs. Philippians 4:19. Bless me with your provision now. Open the storehouse of heaven and pour financial blessings upon me. Give me wisdom as to how to handle all finances and keep me from making any foolish decisions. Bless my work with success. Reveal to me how I can earn more and handle my finances more efficiently. 
Show me where I have spent unwisely and how I can cut back expenses. Show me if I am doing what you want me to do or if you have other work for me. Open my eyes to see where I am not living your way with regard to my finances. Convict me if I need to give more to you and to others. Teach me how to save, spend, invest, and better organize my money. I know that my true treasure is found in you. Forgive me for any times when I have not fully lived that truth. I choose to speak, seek to seek you and your kingdom first in my life, trusting that you will provide all that I need. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So speak that daily, I recommend, over yourself and over your finances, and watch what God will do to get you to the next place in your finances. You have any questions? Huh? I work at Bank of Zachary. It's a community bank. They're about 104 years old. They've been in the area. They're now in Central and Watson. Uh, they're in Zachary, and there's one more I can't think of right now. So they're expanding, but um, it's not a national bank. If that's what you're asking, it's not right. a national bank. It's a community. It's truly a community bank. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. Yes. Okay, I'll talk to you. Uh, how can you bring your credit score up? Pay off debt. Yeah. You can, um, most of it is, is, is paying off your debt. And that's why if you get a copy of your credit report, report and see what's really out there, start knocking off some small balances. Um, the list that you have, the, the, you'll see that, that credit score uh, start to go up. And another thing about like credit cards and stuff, if you have six, seven credit cards, when you go to apply to a bank for a loan, we look at the number of cards that you have. And if you have a lot of just open debt, that does count against you because to them, that's available funds that you have. That's just that's just open money. I'm, I may can you know I give you money, but that's just money that you can go access if you want to. So if you don't need the cards, don't just have countless numbers of credit cards just sitting open because it's revolving lines of credit that you could access, and it and it counts against you when they calculate your you know your debt to income. So close what? whatever you don't. If you don't, if you don't use it, close it. It's not it's not helping you just to have an open credit card. Mm -hmm. Don't because it was going to affect my credit and my credit score, but I went ahead and shut them down anyway. It doesn't. Once I paid them. Okay. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. my, my brother was told that too, and that's been one of the hardest things to get him to drop is why I need to keep some money on and keep a balance. I'm like, that's. I mean, I have, I have one credit card, and I use it because I travel, and that's why I put my plane tickets on or whatever, but I don't have a bunch of open credit because I've watched them calculate and be like, well, they got six credit cards, so they have access to this much money, and when they calculate what you can get, what you can pay versus, uh, you know, what's coming in, then that, they, they do take that into consideration. Yeah, I had a put in for a loan a couple of weeks ago. They told me I hadn't had credit in a long time, which yes. I had. So... Uh, the bank I'm with now, the cap, I've been remembering that for about a year. I got my VA check, Social Security check going as I write the positive low a year. And what they told me I can do, and I did it this week, I applied for it. I got approved for it. Took money out of my savings. I told them to take, first I said 500, I said, well, I'm paying up to 700. They approved it two days ago. But they called using my own money. Mm -hmm. So they're going to mail me a credit card in the mail. I'm expecting it for the next yeah. 10 days before we get it. I went and signed the papers yesterday. A secured contract. credit card secured. will help your credit. And she said it helps you help to build credit. credit. Because I hadn't had credit in a long time. I hadn't mm -hmm. applied for no credit in a long time. So and what a, um, a lot of young, what they have a lot of young people do, the parents do, is for kids, you know, you don't have credit. You can't get credit if you don't have credit. So what they'll do is they'll go and take out a CD secured loan or a savings secured loan, put in the child's name to help their child build credit. So when they're in college, they have, they, you know, they can pay on that. And, and so it helps to build their credit. So when they get out of college, it's not like starting from scratch. It's, and it's just another, you know, another one of those things culturally that I've seen the difference, you know, watching, you know, and it's the generational wealth and stuff is something that we need to, you know, get more on top of. But um, I, you see them helping their, the kids. I'm going I'm to help you build your, your own wealth. I'm going to help you to get your credit established and, and, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, consider that when your kids are getting out. And, and they can't qualify because if you don't have credit, they don't want to give you credit. Baron? Um, can you explain what is going on in the banking industry right now with the small regional banks 
going bankrupt. Well, still bankrupt. Bankrupt, bankrupt and then the big banks. Testing is different than the small banks. So I was Silicon just, Valley went went. Um, they actually went, had the truck got shut down because they started making some some bad decisions. And what it did basically, it wasn't the money that they had the money. It's they started changing interest rates and it spooked the people that were investing in their bank. People started taking the the money out of the bank and like y'all, something must be going on. Y'all know about y'all not disclosing. So when people got scared. They started pulling money out and and. When you don't have money as a bank, you know, you can't operate. You, you have regulators that watch you, and when something's going on, they see people going and pulling out or whatever, then they come in and start to investigate. You know, so you have the FDIC and the OCC, they regulate these banks, and every at least once a year, they come in, they look at everything that we have and to see, do you have, do you have are you doing fair lending? Are you giving better rates to white than black or black to Hispanics? And so they're looking at all the things to make sure that you are, Fair, that you're doing fair lending with your customers, that you're not doing things you're not supposed to do. And if they find issues, they will cite you, they will find you, or when they leave from the exam, there's a sign on the door that's saying you're closed for business. So, I mean, the banking industry as a whole isn't in trouble. This bank just didn't do what they're supposed to do, but if you notice, if you go on sites, most banks have not put something out on their sites to address what's, what's going on and let them know that, you, that most banks are financially secure, they're stable, you know, they have money allocated for any losses and, and they have capital to keep the bank running. So it's not going to be a big thing, but they, they, the bank didn't do some things they needed to do. All right, so I have a, a kind of a question slash comment. And you would know because you, you're kind of a loan person. So when it comes to the whole closing down of accounts, right? So I've heard that if you are like very close to trying to apply for a loan, say like you want a car loan or a house or whatever, that one of the biggest things that do, they do look at is your um, ratio of credit usage, mm -hmm. right? So if you have one credit card that's, you know, say you've got $6,000 that you have as a balance, but you've got five other credit cards that gives you a total like of seventy thousand dollars for a line of credit, but you've got like six thousand that you've used. That ratio isn't that big, but if you actually go and cancel those other five credit cards you aren't using, now you've got six thousand use of a ten thousand dollar card. So you go from six percent usage to sixty percent usage, which takes your credit score down. Is that true? Because it, it, I've heard that that's actually a pretty big thing they look at is the actual usage of your credit availability? Um, it, it depends on the bank. Let me put it that way, because I worked at a couple of banks and they look at it differently. The banks that I worked at, if you have available credit on those cards and it's just sitting there, it counts against your debt to income because they consider that something that you could go and get in addition to you know what we're giving you now, and it, it works against you. I don't know any banks that say, you know, you're, what you're they looking at usage versus, you know, what you actually own and what you can pay. Because if, I guess when they look at it, when they run the numbers, if you owe on six credit cards, you know, um, and that's part of your debt, it's all based on that debt to income calculation. Is that answering your question? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I guess it, 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 it hits the credit score, though. I, I know for sure, like, you know, I, Guilty, like I put everything on my credit card, right? So I, I have a, I can have a pretty big credit card bill every month. I pay it off every month, right, but right. it gets big. But I noticed that literally, like, when I pay the whole thing down, my score will jump like 20, 20 points. And then, like, at the end of the month, when it's sky high, it'll, it'll, it'll fall. Like they're looking at yeah, like right. that, that ratio. Like it's a, it affects the credit score pretty. Yeah, it big. does because my, when I look at my, my credit, my credit card bill. Depending on if I put something on the court that I'm getting ready to pay off or not, my score fluctu it fluctuates. My goal is to have 850. That's the highest you can get. My goal is to keep my credit at, at 850. And if it goes beneath that, I am not happy. You know, um, but it, it, it does play a factor. And I've watched my score go up and down depending on when, oh, when I owe it, it's down. When I pay it, I get the next bill and it goes up. So I think it's more for the credit cards. I'm not sure that banks use it as much as what we see on these statements. But um, I definitely wouldn't have a bunch of just cars sitting up with uh, available money that you're not using. Because what's the point of having if you're not gonna, you know, if you're not gonna use it? And if you do have them and you're not disciplined, you end up you have a tendency to 
to be tempted to use them, and you have money five or, on five or six different cards that you can't pay those bounces in full. So you end up in that debt cycle again. That the interest won't if hit or something? When your save, if your statement comes in, if you pay that bill by your due date, if it's paid off when your bill comes in, you don't, you're not paying any of the interest. It's, it's almost like you, you paid for it. But if you, let, if you carry a balance, you're going to have the interest on what you owe um, that you're going to have to pay. So that's why I advise paying it off at the end of the month. And if you can't pay it off at the end of the month, then I, I normally don't use mine. So as long as you pay when it's due, you're okay. It's just carrying the balance that really hurts you. Or, or it, it costs you, let me put it like that. And then with some cards, if you don't pay on time, um, say if you got a, a promotion, an interest rate of 0% or something, if you don't pay it on time, they go back and they pick up the high interest rate because that was a promotion and now you penalize for not paying it on time. And sometimes they're also, like if there's a promotion period of six months and you miss it on month five, sometimes they will go back and recoup from month one all the interest that would have accrued on you. So, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's income for them. Look at it like that. They're going to get as much as they can, you know, from you, however they can. So if you're going to use it, just be mindful and, and stay on top of those, those payments. And don't make just the minimum if you can afford it. Let me ask you, um, if, if, you're, if you're married, you couples, um, Selena and I have everything together. But her score is continuously 20, 30 points higher than mine. Why is that? Do you, do you have more stuff financed in your name? Or is, like, is everything, like, if, like, do you have a house, a car, um, with, you know, something that's in your name, a credit card that's not in her name? If it, I don't, not that we know of, not that I know of. I get need a, to ask her that. <laughs> get, a, get a copy of your credit report and just see everything that's been reported for you. Get a copy of yours and see what's been reported on you and, and look at the difference and see, because it may be something old that you haven't even thought about forever that maybe needed to be, needs to be shut down or whatever. Just see what's out there. Carrie? Pastor James, me and David had the same situation and I think it's because everything is mostly in his name, even though we share like the mortgages in his name. Even though we have uh, both our name on the title, he f is financed in just his name. It's not joint. So, yeah, my, my credit score is higher than his. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of smiled a little bit when you said that, Dana. <laughs> Going back to the generational um, wealth building that you're saying we need to, like, help. Are you, and helping your children build credit, are you saying, like, opening up a secure credit card for them or opening up a gas card for them but then limiting the gas card to say three hundred dollars so that they build credit so you know that they can't you know i go mean if over you... or because like we give jayla a credit card mm -hmm. and the credit card was in lebaron's name mm -hmm. and but he lowered it so she can't get the full access of the revolving credit right so she was only allowed to use it for her. But if that card is in Barron's name, Jayla's not getting credit for it. But LeBaron said he, she is. Unless she is. you added her. But what is what, ba based on what though? What are they? What are they? What are they basing it on? I, I have no idea. So I, I have never looked at her actual credit score. Her I've just seen has, her. If she has a score, something has been reported for her. You need to see what that is. Yeah. Okay. But if the if that gas card is only in LeBaron's name, only. Jayla not getting credit for that. So you need to see what's being reported because you can only get a score if something's being reported for you. And so for as far as the um, helping to build credit, what I find a lot of parents do is they get a, a loan that's secured by their money, a savings, a savings account or a CD that they put the child's name on when they can legally sign a document. You know, you have to be a legal age to, to sign a promissory note. But once they do that, but that child is responsible for that bill. So if they have a job, or whatever, you pay this. I think some people is a hundred dollars a month. You you pay this, you pay it on time, and it helps to build that credit for the term of that for that term of that loan. Just thought about some. I've been staying in my apartment paying rent since 2000, May of 2017. Okay. Now they run the credit check. I had more than enough income. 
I've got several increases on my VA and disability and Social Security since then. I just thought about that. Now, they run a credit check, so why is that not being reported to credit bureau? I've been paying rent faithfully. Rent's not reported. No, so they not, just thought But they use it to check. They do to make sure credit. that you can so is, to make yeah. sure you can pay and that you don't have any other apartment that you didn't, you know, close out your rent, right? They want to make sure that you can pay, but it's not reported every month like like a loan because it's, it's not a loan. Yeah. It, you know, and you they're, they're, and you, you know you're paying rent, you're paying them for their the use of their property. Mm -hmm. So, um there is some some apartments now that's starting to ask you, do you want this reported? And you and yours may be one that started, just hadn't made it no made it public. So go and ask them, can I still have this reported if you want to? But it, it historically rent has not been um, reported to the credit bureau. You can ask them if they do it. Every apartment does not. I know they started that in California because we're doing it with Mike, but um, it, it, it's not nationwide. But ask them. Thank y'all.